morning, everyone. I'm Stuart Dresner, Chief Executive of Privacy Laws and Business. I'm happy to welcome you to our 32nd Annual International Conference. So this is the world's longest running conference, and we also run public, have publications as well. And we greatly, greatly appreciate your loyal support, that of our sponsors, 18 chairpersons, and your the names are in the conference fol folder. So the theme is GDPR, influence ripples around the world, and uh, which would includes Africa, of course, and I'll refer a bit more to that later. So this is your best opportunity to meet the world's top data protection law experts and decision makers, and of course, your peers. Here, a conversation means just that, during our meals together and uh, social events, and we don't employ bots or artificial intelligence. We use the old style natural intelligence. And of course, artificial intelligence may arise during a session. The ripples you see in the picture are ever expanding and interact with each other. Uh, the large pool represents the GDPR created in Europe, but now rippling out around the world. And it interacts with the Council of Europe Convention 108, represented by the ripples on the left. Countries outside Europe use this instrument to align themselves with European norms. Um, the GDPR's ripples can be clearly seen having an impact on new laws in Argentina and Brazil. In fact, the left of your screen, you can see the Brazilian first bit of the Brazilian law translated into English. Uh, and more on both Argentina and Brazil tomorrow. And we are welcoming here the head of Argentina's Privacy Law Authority, Eduardo Bertoni. And uh, tomorrow we have uh, also Brazil's government advisor, Professor Danilo Donida. On the right, the USA's California's Consumer Privacy Act takes the lead, as California did 20 years ago with its data breach law which had its own rippling effect across the other 49 states, although it took about another 20 years before they all had their own data breach laws. European Justice Minister Vera Jourova, at a conference I attended in Brussels last month, mentioned South Korea as the country where EU adequacy negotiations are underway. At this conference, we welcome not only our featured speaker from Korea, Kwai Bai Park, but also Su Yun Chong, researcher from the Korea Internet and Security Agency. The song Africa, which you heard a few minutes ago, is a way of attracting our attention to several new laws in Africa. And examples are Nigeria's law from this year and Kenya's act from last year. Of course, the social and cultural context is very different from Europe. And in Africa, much data collection is via mobile devices. And with the shortage of doctors, predictive analytics based on big data should be able to help with diagnosis. Generalizations across Africa's 54 countries are futile. What I can say is that GDPR standard may well be too high to achieve in one leap from a blank sheet. At our Portugal and Africa session this afternoon by Lisbon-based law firm Vieira da Almeida, we will learn how African governments are having to adapt GDPR concepts according to national levels of development and cultural context. This is a uh, shot from the screenshot from the Council of Europe Convention, uh, Council of Europe website. I said that the Council of Europe's ripple around the world is smaller than that of the GDPR. However, with its legally binding and recently strengthened Convention 108, several non-member European uh, non-member, non-European countries have ratified the convention. First, Uruguay, and they're all there, but you're too small to see. Uruguay in 2013, Senegal and Mauritius in 2016, Tunisia in 2017, Cape Verde and Mexico last year, and um, Argenti Mexico, uh, Argentina in F and Morocco this year. So these ratifications to the Council of Europe Convention show that these countries wish to align their laws with those in Europe and move towards the free transfer of personal data between each country in the Council of Europe Club. Rather than the um, European concept of privacy as a fundamental right, the Asia-Pacific cross-border privacy rules have been conceived in order to set standards in the context of innovation and e-commerce for the benefit of both business and consumers. The APEC cross-border privacy rules were first adopted in 2005 and updated 10 years later. 
and Australia and Taiwan are the latest economies to participate, joining Canada, Japan, Korea, Mexico, Singapore, and the United States, who are, were already members. Listen tomorrow afternoon to our speakers on Korea and Singapore for their assessment of the importance of the cross-border privacy rules and what's happening in the region. For now, just looking at the last point about uh, anonymization, controllers and processors can help themselves by putting more investment into de-identification and anonymization of your company's personal data. By doing so, to the extent that you achieve anonymization at the end of the spectrum, the personal data you process is outside the scope of the GDPR and national implementing laws. So this is an article, Every Company is a Data Company, which um, I wrote a few months ago. And uh, an example of Every Company is a Data Company is energy company BP, formerly known as British Petroleum. It's moving fast to address its millions of customers individually. Realizing that it sells more cups of coffee than Starbucks in the UK, BP is developing and refining an app which will enable its customers to pre-order coffee to collect when they buy petrol at a gas station. Profiling its customers will enable BP to make offers to individuals which fit their specific interests. Question is, how far is too far? Look at the middle section. The UK's ICO is now focusing on ad tech and specifically real-time bidding for adverts to individuals. As you see from the date there, this report was published just a few days ago. The subject is a good point to stress that in privacy laws and business publications and at our events, we give equal weight to both sides, the privacy laws and the business. The fines are just one thing. Uh, regulator fines attract the attention of top management. So to that extent, the fact that if someone else is being fined, that's generally regarded as a good thing. If your company's fine, that's not so great, but generally it raises the attention of companies to, uh, what, to the importance of GDPR and its uh, impact. So GDPR level fines have only just began, begun with the 50 million euro fine on Google by Francis Keneal in January this year but others are on their way in several of the uh, EU countries, or indeed the EEA countries. Here's another one. This was uh, just last Friday, just in time for this conference, the Garante in Italy imposed a million euro fine on Facebook, just, just as I say, just in time. But it's not only, um, Daniel Vecchi, who's from Italy, here told me that they had already imposed a two million euro fine on uh, the, an Italian energy company. So they are surveying everyone. They're not just attacking, as it were, US tech companies. Everyone's in the frame. Um, so, but regulatory action will not always be fines. The data protection authorities have several tools in their toolbox, and we can expect them to use them across all sectors, not just US-based tech companies, as I was saying. For example, Portugal's, Portugal's data protection authority recently fined a hospital. And then if that's the case, then everyone needs to pay attention. And speaking last night to Andrew Jelinek, who's here from Austria, and also chair of the European Data Protection Board, they have imposed fines, relatively small fines, a few thousand here and there, uh, to smaller organizations. So it's not all the million euros, smaller fines are imposed as well. Some of the new elements in the GDPR are not rippling around the world. And one is collective action by consumers in Europe. That is a group in America called class actions, a group suing an organization for material or immaterial damages. Most data protection authorities are not accustomed to collective action. For example, we learned at our conference in Ireland in May, that some of you were there, that collective action has never been a feature of the legal scene there. But we should expect to see more such cases in the future, more cases of collective action. And then they are driven by two factors which are not really familiar in the data protection environment. The first point is that law firms, some law firms, are offering to fight such cases on a no-win, no-fee basis. And secondly, investors are, some investors are willing to put money into such cases as a financial investment, hoping they'll get a financial return. So this is far away from the um, ideals of the GDPR, but it's all within the law and all is happening, and there are actual cases. In the UK, a group is suing British Airways for damages allegedly suffered as a result of its data breach problems last year. And other cases are being heard against Ticketmaster and Dixon's Carphone Warehouse. So this is a thing which is actually happening. 
So it's not always Facebook as the target. However, this slide we have here shows a case against Facebook fought on a joint basis by consumer groups in Belgium, Spain, Italy, and Portugal. Um, and it's not clear yet to the extent to which data protection authorities get involved in such cases, but for sure they're not experienced in advising consumers on whether they or to what extent they should seek compensation. A second element of the GDPR, which is not rippling around the world, is data portability. This was the subject of the essay on the screen, which won our first ever student essay competition. And is the winner here, Wen Long Lee? Are you here somewhere? Can anyone see him? Hand there, if you got stand up. Yes. Very good. If you would like to be a sponsor for next year's essay competition, just let me know. But there was a second winner as well, um, Alvin Chung, who unfortunately couldn't be here. He's a second year student, undergraduate. Uh, he's a student of jurisprudence at University College Oxford. And uh, he wrote about the advantages and difficulties of making GDPR compliance a competitive advantage. Very much a moot point. From the idealistic point of view, uh, data prote protection and complying with uh, data protection law is a competitive advantage, but it's difficult to prove and is not always the case. After all, um, some companies which have been in the limelight and have attracted regulatory action have not regarded GDPR as a competitive advantage. But it's a good debating point, and do read his essay, and he'll be with us next year. Now, regarding um, privacy as a competitive advantage, that transitions neatly to corporate social responsibility. To what extent does your company see data protection law as something to be suffered or something from which you can see and communicate as a positive? Is it the right thing to do? Now, this image here is deceived by design, shows the front cover of a report published last year by the Norwegian Consumer Council. This is a government-funded body, is well-resourced, and uh, conducts detailed research to support its claims. And the issue is all about design and deployment of colors and apps and on websites, to encourage users to accept the most data monetizing but least privacy-friendly options. The, that the Norwegian Consumer Council influence also ripples around the world because it shares its findings with European consumer organizations and those in the US. Next theme is user, design user experience. France's Data Protection Authority, the CNIL, has also taken up the issue of app and website design. In its report published earlier this year, shaping choices in the digital world. You can see the image there. Um, the report recommends that companies employ user experience professionals to ensure that they see, seem to be fair in the way they collect and share personal data. And uh, user experience can assist evidence of accountability. It's clearly a developing field, and a company's deployment of such skills is increasingly be seen as a way of demonstrating that if the management will is there, they are developing they can develop the way to more effectively comply with the GDPR. Even the uh, not very exciting appearing United Kingdom's National Health Service, the government-funded health service here, has taken the initiative to set up a, a NHS X department. And the purpose of the NHS X department will define strategy and set standards for the National Health Service, for example, on user experience, open standards, information governance, an open source. So we keep our subscribers up to date on new data protection laws and bills, and we research and publish a survey of all the world's national data protection laws and bills. And this is a picture here of the latest survey conducted by our Asia Pacific editor, Professor Graham Greenleaf. Our latest survey published in February reports on, reported on 132 countries with laws and 28 with bills. And of course, it's a moving target. There's always something new coming up. This is the PLMB UK report published in alternate months in both electronic and paper formats. So this is a picture of the German Federal Cartel Office, and that's important because they have drawn attention to the, to the convergence of data protection, consumer, and competition laws, um, which because in February this year, after consultation with the data protection and consumer authorities, announced that Facebook's conduct demonstrated exploitative abuse, quotes, and um, of its dominant position, uh, because the way it collects, merges, and, and uh, brings together its accounts from different services. 
This is not only Facebook. Here you can see last August a French court ordered payment of 30,000 euros damages by Twitter to a group of consumers represented by Cushwazia. This slide informs you we have a one-day conference uh, in London in cooperation with Linklaters. It's all about Asia, the four countries in Asia, and it's happening on 30th of October. I can now declare this conference open.